Go yeah, so I just want to have an informal discussion about uh, the new record you're putting out mm -hmm. and where you're at right now with things. What brings you to Toronto? Press junket. <laughs> 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 now I've got a, I have a show in, uh, um, in Buffalo on Saturday too, so it kind of made sense to get, I think, four days or five days of press out of the way before that, so... Are you guys doing any rehearsing here or anything like that? Uh, no, that doesn't start till um, the end of uh, September, beginning of October. So we'll do that. So I'll come back for that. Yeah. You had a, a couple. You had a lot of days planned for US, and yeah. you kind of put it down to a couple. You trimmed it down. What happened? Uh, basically, what happened was is that uh, the tour support for that fell through, and uh, you know it's not like Canada where you know I can easily float my own boat and that's where I make all my money like personally you know to pay my bills and, and whatnot um, <clears throat> in the states you know to take a full band to the United States I, I obviously need to support so and it, uh, it fell through on well not unfortunately ridiculously after tickets had been put on sale and were on sale for quite a while so I ended up with a lot of upset people and you know no matter how much I might have known about it or not known about it or, well, didn't know about it until it actually was told that to me that it, it was pretty much not going to happen, you know, I have to ultimately take responsibility for it, so. And you still got a couple of shows going on. Uh, well, yeah, we'll play Buffalo, yeah. but uh, I would think that um, what will probably happen is, um, you know, we'll do Canada, take December off, maybe part of January, and then we're going to be going to Europe. And then when we get back, I wouldn't be surprised if we ended up doing, like, the States, so. Maybe on this record. Well, I mean, I got back from touring Lights from Dangerous Species. Uh, you know, it's a heady record, and it definitely was a curveball for the fans, that's for sure. But I really enjoyed it, you know, and it was a record that I really wanted to make. And uh, But when I got home, it actually wasn't even a conscious decision. I was just, over several days, I... Usually, I'm uh, when I'm at home and I'm working. I listen to jazz, predominantly. But um, I went through my playlists on my computer, and um, I had one just with a whole collection of songs, like alt rock from like the you know, kind of mid to mid '80s to the early '90s. And I just started listening to a lot of it and a lot of the songs, and I ended up getting stuck on that for a few days. Like I was like, you know. And then when I went to pick a guitar up to write, it was just really kind of, you know, the remembrance of that of being in my late teens and my 20, early 20s, it, uh, it kind of really just it flowed through me when I, you know, when I started writing. So I wrote Via Dolorosa first, and, uh, and then from there, Arrows of Desire, and very quickly those two songs. And then after that, it was just, you know, I... I went, well, there's a great starting place. And then, you know, the rest is just very subconscious, right? Or unconscious, pardon me. Um, I just did it, <laughs> you know? Uh, I just, you know, just went about writing the album. So. You're going to be playing uh, with a full band on this tour? Yeah. And last tour, you brought out your old drummer, Ian. Yeah. Uh, Ian Brown, right? Mm -hmm. You guys uh, are going to be playing together on this one? Who are you bringing out on the road with you? No, th this one, on this one, Ian's, Ian's got a band uh, back home that's uh, starting to do pretty good so he's doing that um, uh, Pat Stewart played on the record but he's not he won't be coming on the road with me Blake Manning's coming on the road with me who played with me for years um, uh, he's you know he's the drummer live with Massey Hall he drummed Lights of Endangered Species in Vancouver and so but, uh, you know, uh, Blake's playing drums Jimmy Stewart's my guitar player Milo Shangelov is my bass player and Anthony Wright plays uh, keys and fiddles with knobs and moogs and whatnot. So, yeah. And so, some fans were asking if you ever had any plans to tour acoustically again. And oh yeah, absolutely. I love playing acoustically. It's uh, probably my favorite thing to do. Mm. I I think in in Canada it's 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 difficult unless you release a record where it kind of like you know hospital music. I could get away with it because I could present that record in two different ways. I could play it acoustically or I could play it with a band. Um, I've toured other territories acoustically, 
because I, you know, you go there and you, you're, you, you know, you, I can go to England and play acoustically in England, and and that's a very easy thing to do because you know a lot of people in the United Kingdom they're playing catch up and they're not, you know, they haven't been coming to shows for seventeen years or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, the problem in Canada is just market saturation. You come through the band and people pay a certain ticket price, then you come back acoustically, and it's it becomes very difficult to book back into like the same rooms and that sort of thing. So, but yeah, I, I'd love to do it as, as soon as I can possibly do it. Yeah. Yeah, I know all I said. About what do you think about like today's pop stars and uh, where it's going and uh, not, the publicity stunts or whatever? The, they well, are. I mean that's nothing new. The Sex Pistols were a fucking publicity stunt. They were. I mean that was you know that was a you know that was Malcolm McLaren's publicity stunt, right? I mean the fact that they uh, ended up writing a really good record <laughs> that you know had a huge impact on on music you know music history is you know is kind of uh, an oddity, but it, that's happened throughout music. You know, I mean, with regards to something like what happened the other night, what it's. How the only reason there's any outrage about it is because she came out of like the Disney camp, the squeaky clean camp, because no one's going to say the same thing about, um, you know, Lady Gaga or, or or anyone else for that matter. Of course, they're allowed to do whatever they want, so it's a stupid double standard. She should, who gives a shit what she does with a foam finger? I don't care. Um, you know, it's not like she's Gigi Allen or <laughs> you know or what Gigi Allen was like on stage. He died on stage, for Christ's sake. So, I mean, you know, uh, there's been worse, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's definitely been worse. You know, someone wants to be offended, go to a Guar show. Right. <laughs> you know, if that's not even offensive, that's just awesome. So, I think it's more like the, the, the fact that the media puts the entire spin on that only, you know, that 30 seconds of the entire show as if it was the only thing that happened. You know, that kind of makes it sad. Well, of course, it's pathetic. Right, it's pathetic, and they'll grab onto whatever they can and whatever, and all instead the, of focusing on the other bands, the artists that are actually making music, right? Yeah, that, that are there doing, you know, whatever else. So, and in her, and in, in you know, and the reality is, is it worked. What she did worked. Right. I mean, that's what everyone's overlooking. We can debate as parents as the rest of it. Was it a good? It fucking worked. What do you think about what's happening in Syria today? And uh... well, I mean, the U.S. the UN the UNSC just finished their meeting about I think about two and a half hours ago, three hours ago, maybe a little longer now. I can't remember when I last checked. They've said nothing coming out of that meeting. Of course, the only the five permanent members matter. Everyone else that's on the rotate, it's, they they don't have permanent veto power, so it doesn't matter. Um, the uh, introduction of uh, of uh, the suggestion made by the United Kingdom will be ignored by the Russian and the Chinese. The Chinese, I think, will play it a little cooler. I think they might abstain, knowing that Russia will veto it. The Russians have more, far more at stake. They have a naval base in Syria. They have, whether on the books or in the works, about $5 billion in military sales um, to the Syrians right now. And, uh, you know, it's important to remember that within the context of, of talking about regimes that are oppressive, I mean, you know, the Russians will use their veto with regards to Syria, um, you know, to protect the fact that they have a major naval base in the Med. Um, just as the same way the United States can proclaim itself a champion of freedom and, uh, and justice, and yet, you know, the U.S. Fifth Fleet is in Bahrain with NAVSENT, and they'll do nothing about the fact that the Bahrain monarchy has put down, violently put down, pro-democracy protests in that country. What do you think the repercussions will be if it actually... If it well, what, see, here's the thing. What they'll do is, is it'll have to be limited, right? If, I mean, the UN, the, the Security Council at this point is inconsequential because they'll just act as NATO, right, like they did in Libya. Or, actually, it was Libya sanctioned. Libya was UN sanctioned, right? So, but they'll act as NATO. So they'll go in, and, and what they'll probably do is, is they'll, have, they'll have some Marines on standby as to whether they'll actually use them. I have no clue. Maybe in, uh, in some kind of maneuver to, to, to 
perhaps evacuate civilians on the coast. I have no clue. But they'll use tomahawks. And it won't, they won't target, unless if they have the intelligence weapons caches, they'll target infrastructure in the capital. And by doing so, try to send a message that, you know, this, what can befall you, you know. But the reality is, is that it, what's going on in Syria is not cut and dry. It, it is not good guys versus bad guys. Um, there is definitely an element of that, but you have to remember that the, the opposition is made up of, of, again, fractious groups and groups that don't necessarily see eye to eye on things except their mutual dislike for the regime. So with regards to the getting back to the Russians and how with you know and, and their position they're very worried about who, you know if he goes Assad goes who comes next. And they're also very worried about the northern nor, uh, any kind of northern spread of militant Islam, right? Because it creeps towards them. So um, you know and if you put that in any kind of Western context, that's a decent concern. I mean, we can use drones in Yemen because we're worried about activities and, you know, subsequently plots being hatched there. Um, but the Russians can't, right? And we forget that we back bad guys, too, that do horrible things. And that during the Iran-Iraq war, the CIA provided satellite intelligence coverage for the Iraqi army to use chemical weapons against the Iranians, or that when Saddam Hussein gassed Halabja, the, the, you know, the Congress tried to pass a motion to stop all um, military assistance and economic funding to Baghdad, which was killed, and then the Reagan administration continued to fund him. You know, it, it, it all has to be taken within context. We don't go and do things unless there's a reason. Mm -hmm. The whole whitewash of, of oh, the people is that when do we ever when seriously when have we ever ever in the post war world ever cared about that we don't it's all about what you know it makes perfect sense for our interests to have syria basically be co-opted and turned into a western client state right it will help israel incredibly mm -hmm. and it will marginalize hezbollah in lebanon If you could ask Bashir so. al-Assad a question, what would you ask him? Well, I mean, I don't really know. I mean, it's just kind of like, I would probably say, you know, how about just amnesty for fucking off, mm -hmm. right? But then again, you run into the same vacuum that Iraq is now in. Who takes control of the country? Or we you know it's not like you're. It's not like you're going to go take two years of, of destructive civil war that, that that's that that's you know taken so many lives and displaced so many people, and then just suddenly have awesome free elections two months later. It's just not going to happen. So you run the risk of the military stepping in, and if the military steps in, how long does the military, how long is the military in control of the country before the elections are elections occur, and then how much. Do they influence those elections, or the judiciary, or everything else? You know, it could be swapping a, a greater evil, evil for a lesser evil that could be, then become a greater evil. You don't know. Um, you know, so I mean, make no mistake. The use of chemical weapons is pretext. The UN should be able to finish their job and determine what happened outside of Damascus, um, what was used, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and uh, you know. Uh, uh, Ban Ki Moon has said they need another four or five days to do that, and so they should wait. How's touring lately? I mean, um, give it that you, you know, it's been, I don't know how many years now since you've been touring, but it's, it's going to be 20 years. Yeah. How does, it, uh, how does it feel on the body these days? What's uh, the, you know, the party element of it and all that? How, is it toned down a little bit now? Oh, I don't. I, even <laughs> back in the day, I mean, I didn't drink from the ages of... I, I, didn't, I don't do drugs, and I didn't drink between 20 and 32, mm -hmm. right? And even when I started drinking at 32, you know, I have one beer. But on tour, I'm, it's pretty simple, man. I get up in the morning, I have coffee, I do work, sound check, eat dinner 
play the show, get off stage, do a meet and greet, have a shower before the meet and greet, do a meet and greet, <laughs> go back on the bus, change into pajamas, have a cup of tea, and usually eat something and watch a film. That's my night. <laughs> That's about the extent of party that happens on the road. In 2006, you had a you were diagnosed with bipolar, yeah. and you had mentioned in an interview in 2008 about how there was a responsibility that went with that with certain fans that had um, been emailing you and asking for advice to the point where you were actually on the phone with somebody one time when they were they were going to a hospital and you had to direct them yeah. because they were threatening. I just stay on the phone. I, well, in, given in that situation, it was just best to stay on the phone with them, and, and while they're in the waiting room at the hospital. And then while they got in um, and they actually saw the psychiatrist or the, the doctor that was on duty. Is that the piece of responsibility, is uh, that is that a take part every day in your life now? Uh, do you communicate with no, fans I, regularly about the bipolarism? and, and Sometimes I do, sometimes I do, and, and, and it, it, it depends. I mean, you know, I'm not solely in charge of all the, my social media pages, mm. so... <clears throat> Sometimes I can get somewhere, and there will be, I'm, I don't know if messages have been come and gone or what, what's gone on, but, um, you know, if I, if I think something is serious enough, yeah, I'll, I'll respond to it, um, you know, but you have to kind of weigh that with, you know, attention-seeking and, and that sort of thing. So Have you managed to create any, any special bonds with fans because of that? Oh, yeah, you meet people all the time that, you know, they, they consider... You know the fact that you talk openly about it and that sort of thing, inspirational and stuff, and that it's helped them and 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 what they're going through and that sort of thing. And you know that's awesome. You know, I mean, for me, it's just that's common sense. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. I mean, it's not something I'm ashamed of. No, you're ch you're a champion for the cause. And well, and, yeah. You know, I was born with the damn problem, so you know, unless I want to, you know, unless I want to basically reduce my entire life to. You know, oh shit. <laughs> um, you know, that's it's it is what it is. And uh, do you think? That, I mean, a lot of creative people get diagnosed with some sort of mental illness. Do you think it's a, maybe it, it can be a part? It can actually help the process of creativity at times. Hmm. I don't know that the the that necessarily mental illness is a trigger. I I think it I, it might be. Um. I mean, it's part and parcel of who you are as a person, right? I mean, there's been people... That, it's not necessarily artists. I mean, there are mathematicians who are... You know what I mean? It, it, it really depends, you know? Uh, but, I mean, there have been, obviously, artists throughout history who, you know, who have suffered from mental illness, and largely, you know, obviously, we look at their actions now in retrospect, and and say, yes, they probably had problems, which, of course, at the time, they were undiagnosed because those sorts of things didn't exist. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at something, someone like, say, Vincent Van Gogh or, or, you know, I mean, Mark Rothko. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mark Rothko for sure. And, you know, I mean, you, John Lennon. Yeah. Absolutely mag depressive. No question about it, I would say. But, um, you know, but, you know, at, at the same time, there's plenty of... Uh, Plenty of artists who have gone through their whole life and, you know, been able to run the spec, delve into bloody everything and run the spectrum of everything and uh, um, kind of take it all in and use that. And they have, you know, a very specific process of how they do things. Mm -hmm. So it's all, I think it's different for everybody, you know. Do you have a disciplined way in which you create? Um, or th does it just happen spontaneously? Do you oh, actually it's, sit yeah. down and actually like um, work on it, or does it sort of do you just get to wait for the spark to happen and then go with it? Oh yeah, I mean it's unconscious. <clears throat> you know, it just happens. I just do, mm -hmm. right? Really, you know. Um, obviously, if you could be, a, you know, kind of imagine being teleported into a workshop with all your favorite tools, that's kind of what it's like. And then you go to work, right? Because you love the tools, yeah, so, sure. Right, yeah. yeah, right? But, uh, you know, yeah, it, it, it's, you know. Do you have a studio at home where you create? Or? Oh, yeah, I just I have an office upstairs, and I just use, you What know, do you use to record on? And just, I use GarageBand, yeah. you know. John Dante, who 
you know, came up with it for Apple, who works at Apple, uh, is an acquaintance, and so I jump on, I chat every once in a while, him and I talk about this, that, and the next thing, and he's been really pushing me to go full on onto Logic, and I'm a little kind of mistrustful of it because it's just better sounding, and I'm one of those people that views demos as sketches, right, and there's not the final product. So I like to keep it as sketchbook as possible so that when I do the final product, it's the final product. So. Um, you you won a couple of Junos, uh, but you boycott the Junos. Well, I, I don't necessarily boycott. I don't boycott the Jun. I, I, I just don't see the relevance in taking art and turning it into a contest. Right? I don't see what that has to do with fucking anything. Some people can talk about it being a celebration of the industry. Well, if that's the case, then I'd like to know why the people in this... Well, now that's obviously not the case because they fucking ruined it, didn't they? And it's their own damn fault. But, um, you know, why back when I initially made the decision not to do it, why we're celebrating an industry that all these people make a living off the fact that, you know, we create shit and yet they somehow are the more important piece of the puzzle. Like, what the hell is that even about, you know? I'm not the CEO of a record company. I don't get a retirement package, you know? Shit can go suddenly wrong for me, and I'm working at fucking Starbucks. So, you know, not to say that working at Starbucks is a bad job, but I'm just, you know, I'm just saying, right? But, I, and then there's the other side of it, which is just like, you know, you, you wouldn't take Juan Moreau and Marc Chagall and put them up against each other and go, well, you know, who's better? <laughs> Why would you fucking do that? You appreciate them for what they are. They're both different, and that's great, because if everything were the fucking same, then it would be pointless. And to say that one thing is better than something else is a complete is completely misrepresentative of music as, as something as, you know, as being quintessential to human existence. Right? Why would you do that? Why would you want to limit anyone's perception of something to, oh, that won this? Right? How about just go listen to fucking everything and decide what you like? You don't need anyone telling you. You don't need a trophy to tell you. Who cares, man? Just fucking go and enjoy it all. You know? You know, if you're, if you're, if you're feeling, if you, you know, if you're feeling aggro, go put some black flag on. You know, and if you, you know, if you're feeling, you know, kind of, you know, relaxed or whatever, you know, go put, go put some Thelonious Monk on or, you know, why limit yourself, you know? And, um, so yeah, it, it's, it is kind of weird. It is kind of weird, but I don't get it really. I really kind of don't understand the entire process of it, so... Jeff died, your original bass player, yeah. a little while ago, and uh, you had mentioned in an interview with Strombo, George Strombolopoulos, that even at the at the funeral, uh, well, the, well, the memorial, the yeah. memorial, um, different band members came at different times, and mm -hmm. it, you guys couldn't even reunite to, to have a conversation about it. Has that subsided at all? Is no. there any chance that the that the band will ever get back together in no. its entirety? Well, I mean, I, I when I got there, I just I I just went. When I was told to go, I showed up. Warren was there, you know, of course, and Ian was there. And, you know, so I was talking to Ian and whatever, and I hadn't seen Ian in 10 years. So I was talking to Ian, and that actually led to me, Ian coming over for dinner, which is how we kind of mended, fen mended fences and stuff and that kind of thing. But um, I, I, I left, and we were all, me, Ian, Warren... We are all out on the sidewalk. We were having a smoke, and someone was there with a cell phone, and someone got a text that it was from Dave asking whether we had le I had left or not. And I was just like, fucking really? After all this time, the man's fucking dead. Like, you know, we how many years did we spend in a van together? You know? I mean, you know, what? what? So, no. I've played shows for 5440, plays guitar for them now. I've walked right fucking past the dude. You know. 
me and Dave were never friends. We were never friends at all, you know. And that's like, you know, the whole thing that kind of happened with that band was is from day one when Dave was entered the equation, um, you know, I largely placated him with, like, kind of more writing credit than he really deserved. And, you know, and I don't know. I always felt like he was working angles and stuff, and it was never really about what we were doing. Any specific city you want to, you want to, you're looking forward to, you want to maybe shout out to? You or? know, I've been across this country so many times, coast to coast by land. Um, everywhere is awesome, to be honest with you, because it's all different, you know what I mean? I mean, as a musician touring this country, I mean, you've done sound and stuff, and you, you know what I mean? You get a unique perspective. You understand why Quebec is Quebec and needs to be Quebec, you know? You understand the Maritimes. If you're from the West Coast and you've never been there, you know, you get to understand why people are the way they are in certain parts of the country, and you understand that what makes this country great is that we all are in it, mm -hmm. you know? Whereas, you you know, you can have very provincial attitudes out west about oh, how we don't need anybody else, right? Well, you know what? Have you been across this country? Have you seen, have you talked to people? Have you, you know, ha have you been to these places that you're, that you're, you know, calling out? Do you live in a small town in Quebec? And, you know, what does a stop sign really need to say stop and array on it when everyone speaks French in the damn town? It's a freaking red octagon. You know what it means. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, you know, you get into the whole thing. Well, then how come cereal boxes out west have to be English and French? You know, it's, well, hey, it's cheaper to obviously print it one way instead of two different ways. And, you know, second of all, it's, we live in a, you know, that's the one thing about this country and, and the perception that people have about it that are against the whole kind of thing. We live in a bilingual, uh, bilingual nation. How is that bad exactly? How is knowing two languages a bad thing? Oh no, I know two, I can speak two different languages. That's fucking terrible, <laughs> you know? I mean, you go to Montreal, which is easily, I, and I don't know if you agree with this, but easily the most Canadian of all Canadian cities, because people just, it's back and forth. It's you know one of the only cities that has a, a real identity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. French to English, French to English, and then fucking Swahili for about all well, you know what I mean you've got you've got a great immig immigrant population there so you can have people going from French to Greek to English all in the same goddamn conversation it's, and it's bloody fantastic how is that not awesome you know I mean that's just I mean that's great culture and uh you know but that that, that whole that insular mindset that people are trapped in in in, in some parts of the country it, it baffles me. It baff I would have loved to have grown up in a place like that and been exposed to that. You know? I grew up right on the coast, as west as you can goddamn get. And, you know? And I remember when French came into school as a mandatory thing. I was in grade six or something. And, um, you know, it's... Uh, from all the French that I took in school, it served me well. You know, the time I've spent in Quebec to the time I've spent in France. So, you know, je ne parle pas. Je ne parle pas le français, but it, uh, you know, I'm not fluent in it, but I can get by. And, it, but even that is, I don't know, I have massive regrets with regards to that. I, you know, I have passable Japanese, a little bit of German, a little bit of Spanish. Um, but, you know, I mean, I've got kids that watch Door of the Fucking Explorer that, you know, that are coming up and counting to ten in Spanish and by themselves because they've watched Dora, you know? <clears throat> and it's just, you know, it, it's those things that, you know, they broaden your horizons, you know what I mean? And it's, I don't know. So with regards to, you know, playing in this country, everywhere is great because it's, you know, when you come right down to it, it's every place has got its own special thing about it, and that's what makes the country damn a great country. Mm -hmm. So, thanks a lot. Man. Hey, man, pleasure. Appreciate it. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you.